Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Festival of Urbanism. I'm Nicole Gurren, Professor of Urban and Regional Planning here at the University of Sydney, and I'm the director of the Henry Halloran Research Trust. It's my absolute pleasure to be chairing this event. And of course, before we begin the proceedings, let me pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land who've cared for and continue to care for country. Of course, the University of Sydney stands on the Gadigal land. And as we do pay those respects, I'm mindful that many traditional owners, both here in inner Sydney and elsewhere across Australia, aren't able to afford decent housing in their own country. I'd also like to recognise and pay my respects to all Aboriginal elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal people here tonight and on our online audience. And tonight I'd particularly like to recognise Councillor Yvonne Weldon, the first Aboriginal councillor of the City of Sydney, who spoke at Monday's Festival of Urbanism event here in this room at our panel on ethical governance and the just city. And she reminded us, of course, that we're a very long way away from justice, particularly housing justice for Aboriginal people in Australia. And so tonight's agenda is whether we should, whether we can, renovate or detonate Australia's housing system. I'm clearly inspired by our property uh, industry, who have never found a slogan that they didn't like. But of course, here at the Festival of Urbanism, we don't usually do slogans. Um, but I've made an exception for tonight because I do think it's a very fundamental question. Here we are, 100 days into a new Commonwealth government. We've got daily headlines about the now it's the looming mortgage crisis, it's house prices up or down, it's the rental affordability, the extreme rental stress experienced by so many Australians and of course homelessness. So our new government's Housing Australia Future Fund will invest in 30,000 social and affordable housing homes over the next five years. By my calculation, that might be about 4% of Australia's total new housing supply. We can put that number against the estimated current need for 450,000 social and affordable housing dwellings, how, however you want to measure it. Um, and we can also ask whether... <laughs> Sorry. It's actually ridiculous, isn't it, to be talking about a commitment of 4% of our total housing stock. We're being very, very, very polite. <laughs> but I do have to very politely say, look, I've got to, I've got to control this. We've only got an hour tonight. But of course, it's a welcome um, commitment. Now, we've got, we do have a million, and I'm, I can see my colleague here, Hal Pawson in the audience, he estimates that we've got a million low-income renters in housing stress, but no plans so far to increase the rate of Commonwealth rent assistance. Ironically, the subsidy paid to our 1.2 million landlords in the form of negative gearing and so on will actually rise as their costs rise with interest rates. But major tax reform is off the table, as we understand. And we do, all in this room, understand the politics of housing policy in Australia. It is hard to make real change. And so one thing I really do welcome, and I think many people here welcome as well, is our new government's clear commitment to leadership and to national leadership in this space. They've committed to developing a national housing and homelessness plan for Australia. And of course, that is very long overdue. But at the risk of stretching my own metaphor, 
tonight we're asking whether it's going to be enough to plan for some modest renovations, maybe a cosmetic facelift, perhaps a room or two to expand to, you know, house our growing uh, population, um, or whether our very foundations have become so rotten that we need with our housing system to start again. So to help us answer that question, let me introduce our distinguished panel. And you will see we're waiting for one uh, very distinguished panellist who's going to rush in uh, right from the halls of parliament any minute. Actually, I might introduce her in her absence. Jenny Long is the Greens member for the seat of Newtown in the New South Wales Legislative Assembly. She's the Greens New South Wales housing spokesperson and she's led campaigns for renters' rights and supported people to navigate the complex social housing system in New South Wales. Dr Ben Spies Butcher is Senior Lecturer in Economy and Society at Macquarie University. His research focuses on the political economy of social policy and the welfare state and he's very well known to those of us in the housing world. Leo Patterson Ross, also well known, famous or infamous, CEO of Tenants Union of New South Wales. He's long worked in housing justice and spent more than a decade assisting renters, their advocates and the broader public to understand and navigate the housing system. Rebecca Pinkston is CEO of Bridge Housing, which supports 5,500 people living in 3,500 homes across Sydney. Before joining Bridge, Rebecca worked for the New South Wales government across the social housing sector. John Engler Hi. is the CEO of Shelter New South Wales and has been involved across social, affordable and specialist housing for most of his professional life. He's a qualified urban planner. I am. Welcome. <laughs> And he's been committed to delivering housing solutions, particularly for those for whom the market has failed. And Carrie Hamilton is a finance professional with 25 years experience in affordable housing and policy roles in the United States and Australia. She's focused on innovative partnership and project debt equity strategy. She consults to government and to affordable housing developers. And I can just see Jenny, welcome yeah, so much. Um, you need a mic, yeah, so we'll, we'll get you mic'd up. So I'm going to kick off our conversation. I'm going to try and keep myself and our panellists strictly to time. But I want to start with a set of questions for our panellists before we open up the questions and the conversation to you, our audience. And thanks to those of you online who've already sent questions in ahead of time. I'm going to do my best to get to many of them. They're excellent. But we also have a roving mic for people here in the room. All right. Let's start with how we got here. Ben, you study the political economy of social policy. In a nutshell, how would you explain Australia's systemic housing problems? Yeah, easy to summarise in 30 seconds or I'm less. I'm so glad I got you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, an intimidating audience to do it to. Look, I'm going to try and be very simple and do three main things. Obviously, there's a, a lot of other stuff that's happened. But um, Australia built a model around home ownership, a model that was actually pretty innovative at the time and did some things very well and has led us to have a series of quite profound problems. I'm going to say there are three things that we need to really work out. So one is that because so many people uh, realistically could afford home ownership, including lots of blue collar workers who could realistically think that they were going to get to home ownership, we created a system of private tenancy which is one of the worst in the world. Um, so we have a real tenure problem, which is there is an enormous tenure cliff between the private rental market and the other forms of tenure. Um, and if everyone is only going to stay in private rental for a tiny period of time because they know they're going to go somewhere else, that's maybe not such a big deal. Um, but when lots of people are trapped in private rental, can't see their way out of it, are raising families in private rental, that's a really serious issue. The next bit is that we've now got a system, uh, much of which is built around capital gains. Uh, so we had a deregulation of the finance sector, which has partly led to lower interest rates, not right now, but in general, um, and much easier access to capital. 
But what that largely did was that it meant that you still had to have some wealth in order to access any of this capital. You need to have security, a deposit from someone. Um, and what it meant was there was just heaps more money at auctions to bid up prices. And that has led to a model where people increasingly think about housing as a, a way of being able to capture the growth in capital gains. Uh, and lots of money flooding into that system where you need to have some money first before you can get into it. And then I think, and this is a really tricky bit, is that we have a politics of housing that rather than try, it knows those problems, right? It's not like politicians don't understand those problems. Um, so we have th those two big problems. But the politics of the system uh, means that we try to reinforce them rather than try to roll them back. And that's partly because uh, two thirds of the population, including the wealthiest two thirds and the highest income two thirds, uh, don't have to deal with the private rental system. Yeah? So if you're a politician, you have to take a, a model uh, where two thirds of the population have material interests against you. Not only that, we've built a system where we've told people to put their life savings into one, not just one asset category, one physical dwelling often. Um, and then we've uh, put them into a deregulated financial market where they possibly could see large losses. Now, obviously, governments are not going to let that happen. And so we have a default guarantee that underwrites house prices and, in fact, tries to push them up rather than pushing them down, because obviously no government is going to withstand um, people losing half their house values and uh, start having people foreclose on their mortgages. Yeah? So we've got this very tricky situation. In fact, what they've done instead is use the tax system and first home buyers grants to be able to inflate this system, which is not only most people's form of uh, tenure and investment, it is now one of the main uh, sectors left of blue collar employment, where the people who are employed in that sector, because it's a market sector, you might hear that supply is the solution to bring down house prices. Well, guess what happens when house prices are going down? They stop constructing buildings because they want to sell them for a profit. And that means that people in the construction sector lose their jobs. So for a whole range of reasons, we have a, a, a political problem that's kind of turbocharged to detonate if we try to solve the social problem. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> and just for our online audience, just so you know, this is actually like a pantomime tonight. We have an audience in the room that are hissing, that are murmuring, because this is no good. And they've just applauded an expert, but absolutely damning diagnosis of where we are and how we've got here. Jenny. Hello. We're I have a, I have a novelty you... mic to remind everyone I'm late. <laughs> we are, we're hoping you can help lift us up. You've long campaigned for housing justice in your electorate and you're a spokesperson for the Greens. Very ambitious, but I, I would actually say very well thought out housing policy. Is it possible to repair Australia's housing system? Look, it is, and thanks so much, Nicole, and apologies. I've just come straight from Parliament, so I literally did my last division, got in a large traffic jam and arrived here. So apologies that I'm late. Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we are here on Gadigal land and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, recognising it always was and always will be First Nations land, um, and say it's really wonderful to be in this beautiful museum. Um, it's great to be here. Um, Look, I can't help but start with what happened just today in question time because I feel like my brain just exploded and maybe it's useful to share this. Um, so you might have noticed over the last, you know, I don't know, six to 12 months that the focus on the housing crisis has been pretty much in the news every single day that people are talking about rental horror stories of being evicted from their home, families can't get homes, there are other families living in tents. There is a full rental crisis going on. Today I asked the Premier of New South Wales whether he would revisit um, putting an end to no grounds evictions. And his response was, I'm not sure if the member for Newtown has noticed, but we are not running a Greens socialist government. Well, I had noticed that they weren't running a green socialist government as, a, as point one to that, and I made it very clear to him that I had noticed that and no one was under any false illusions that they were. But the fact that we're talking about a third of the population in New South Wales 
living in absolutely dire private rental crises with a state government that is dealing with a 50,000 plus application. So that's over 100,000 people currently on the public housing waiting list just in this state, unable to be able to access public housing. And for the Premier who is positioning himself as someone ready to go to an election suggesting that reforming rental laws in the state would be some kind of socialist utopia, really demonstrates the kind of political challenges that we face and that Ben sort of articulated then in terms of the current dynamic. I know I was going to bring some hope, so I'll say, <laughs> I'll say I think there's a couple of things. The first is to say that if we, if we look at the, the health crisis we've been in the last couple of years versus the housing crisis we are facing and the inequality crisis, that unlike... COVID, unlike the health crisis, we have solutions. Like people in this room know the answers. And so I think what's incumbent on all of us is to actually be saying, this is not a, it's not an insurmountable problem. There are actually really clear cut solutions that advocates, that experts, and that people living in insecure housing have been advocating for, for many, many years. And that crisis is growing, but we don't need to feel hopeless about that because there are solutions. What does the solution look like? Yes, supply is not the answer. But what is the answer is pretty simple. It's not counting people that are homeless on the street. And I often find this, you know, sure, data is useful. But you don't solve homelessness by doing a street count or having CEOs sleep out in Martin Place for one night. You solve homelessness by investing in massive amounts of public, social and affordable housing. And what that looks like in reality, is not what we were promised in the last federal election of 10,000 homes. What that looks like is a million homes. Because what that looks like, and this is the Greens' vision, is to say that we need to actually address this crisis at the scale with which it is being delivered to our community. And the crisis is real. Because if you look at the pressure now on people, whether it be in the flood impacted areas or the bush impacted areas, the kind of crisis that we were seeing in the rental stress in the inner city of Newtown is now worse up where my Greens colleague, the member for Ballina, is seeing it happening up there. It's actually worse and it's worse in regional areas. And so the fact that we don't see that investment, what does that look like? It looks like recognising that we need to invest in housing in the same way that we invest in healthcare, is the same way that we invest in public transport, in the same way, well, and private transport, if you're asking the Liberal National Government, that's a side dig. But it's the, it's the idea of saying that we need to be looking at Billions of dollars being invested to build homes that are going to provide people with safety and security. Now, that doesn't mean giving developers public land to do it. It means recognising that there is a role for the state to play in dealing with the housing crisis in the way that there is a role for the state to play in providing public education, public hospitals, public transport. And if we start positioning the idea of public housing and recognise the need for that in that same frame, that is a starting point. The final thing I add on that is that the, currently the people living in public housing are in the worst state of anyone in this state. If we think private rental is bad, then you've not met the New South Wales government, which is the worst landlord in the state. And so part of the other political challenge we have is that any reform to rental protections will have an impact on the complete failures of the New South Wales government when it comes to the idea of rental protections. And that's not just a New South Wales specific thing. That's an issue across the country in that the failure to invest in and maintain public housing, to treat public housing tenants with dignity has actually meant that we've seen across the board private landlords being able to get away with all sorts of things because the governments themselves get away with horrific treatment of tenants within public housing. But I leave it there and I look forward to the discussion. There will be discussion. Um, Leo, we know that in terms of housing disadvantage, it is lower income ten uh, rent tenants in the private rental sector who are the worst off. Do you think we can renovate the system in their favour or do we need more radical action? Uh, thank you, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of land as well. Um, it's a hard question. I've been tossing, I, I, I don't want to get too caught up in semantics, so I, I kind of just want to say let's just raise it 
and let rebuild. But there's some important things about housing that I think we should make sure to preserve. And, and the personal connection to home is something that we wouldn't want to lose or uh, get rid of. And, and really, that's what we want to preserve. That's what we want to give to more people, the, the current perceptions, the current connections that people have to their places uh, of home is, is, is what we need to, to keep. I think that there's another way of thinking about uh, housing that we haven't really uh, done properly. And that's one of the big problems that we have in kind of address the, the, the political question, the social question. Um, and that's recognizing housing as an essential service and saying, look, if we had a situation where uh, the electricity went out and a whole town went black uh, and, and no one had any power, there would not be a partisan debate about whether that's a problem. There would be universal agreement that we should get the power back on, we should connect people with that essential service. Uh, similarly with healthcare, food, uh, anything you like to rename an essential service, there is a much greater degree of agreement uh, that it's important to make sure that the community has genuine, affordable, available access to the service. And then we work out the best way to deliver that. So in some uh, industries, that's public provision. In some industries, we do leave it to a more market-based solution. Food's a, a good example where there, there's not actually a lot of debate about whether that should be nationalized, right? Nevertheless, it's an essential service. And what we do do, even in that most privatized kind of essential service, is we have really uh, clear regulation. We make sure that people aren't being poisoned. We make sure that the restaurants are being cleaned. And you know who is responsible, because there is a food license to, to handle the food. You know whose fault it is if the place is not being uh, run well. So we can do that in housing. We can say, look, we need to have a, a certain standard that keeps people safe and healthy and allows them to live a dignified life. And that looks like the physical side of the property. We think that the, the relationship between consumer and provider uh, needs to ensure that the person can actually use the property for the, for the intent that it has, which is a home, which means that you have it be reliable, stable, you can stay there for as long as you need it. Uh, and then we also have some standards around the providers of the housing and say, if you're going to get involved in this essential service, you need to step up to a certain standard. You need to know what you're doing. You need to know what the law is. You need to have enough money to actually carry out repairs. You need to have a plan around this in the same way that we do for most other essential services. There's no essential service I've found so far that doesn't have some kind of licensing or regulation uh, scheme. Housing is the only one. And I think that speaks to the, the reason we don't have that is it speaks to this, this history of uh, how we've, we've got here, where we have uh, asked people to, to participate without asking them to think about the person at the other end of the agreement. Uh, so looking at uh, housing as an essential service, there has been debate about this, and people in this room have written about housing as essential infrastructure or uh, the, the infrastructure of care. Uh, but it's often focused at social housing. Um, and it's often focused at kind of the, the way that government already agrees it should participate. Um, and I think we need to expand that to say all forms of housing need to be included in this. Uh, because all forms of housing interact with each other. So we, we have, um, you know, the public housing waiting list is really an expression of demand for something better from the private rental uh, sector. We have uh, people who are, who are waiting because the private rental sector does not work for them. And then we have high house prices uh, we, because the, the private rental sector does not offer the stability that people are after. Uh, I think some people, like to make money out of housing, but I think most people want housing to be uh, their, their form of tenure that keeps them safe, that keeps them home. And at the moment, owner occupation is the only uh, form that is available, in theory, if you have enough money, where public housing is too limited, it should be expanded significantly, but that, that's the, the, the quantum that people have to deal with. So we need to uh, make sure that whatever model we have, and, and the, the, particularly the new federal government, but every level of government has a model of housing that you know, understands the interactions between all the different aspects. Um, and in terms of uh, the opportunity for reform, it's interesting, the, the Premier's comment today, because uh, the Conservative government in the UK 
has introduced legislation to end no-grounds evictions to licensed landlords to ensure that that is, is spread across the country. So um, I, I don't know if Theresa May or Boris Johnson or Liz Truss think of themselves as green socialists. I suspect <laughs> not. But they're certainly acting in the way that we'd expect from a 21st century country that wants to make sure that people actually have housing. Mm. Here, here. So, Rebecca, as CEO of Bridge Housing, do you think that expanding social housing is the way to fix our housing system? Um, yeah, look, I, I do think it would be bad if I said no, wouldn't <laughs> it? Um, I, I, I do think that community housing providers have to be at the heart of solving the housing crisis. And the reason that I say that is because if we did live in a socialist republic, um, I would probably be advocating for state housing authorities to do it. But I've worked on both sides of the fence and I can tell you community housing providers do it better. And the reason that we do it better, there's two reasons for that. It's about the community-based nature of our businesses and it's also about the way that we enter into property development and think about property development. So, so in terms of property development, it is true that community housing providers have a number of benefits that private developers don't have. We have GST benefits, we have land tax exemptions, as we rightly should, because when we're developing housing, we're not developing it to give profits to shareholders, we're developing housing to maximise the amount of social and affordable housing that we deliver on the ground for people in need. So I really, um, I've heard a lot of debate about, well, we need to give more tax exemptions to private developers and we need to do this and that. Actually, we need more housing on the ground and to do that effectively, you need to deliver through a not-for-profit vehicle um, that will maximise the amount of social housing on the ground for people in need. Um, the other thing I'd say is that community housing providers can bring together different parts of the system to great effect. So we can leverage against our balance sheets to, to, to borrow and finance new developments. We can work with the private industry to build that housing. Um, but unlike the private industry, we're not looking for the profit margin. And unlike the government, we can actually borrow against our properties. So we bring together the best of both worlds with a focus on the social and the outcomes for our community. Um, and, and we've seen that actually recently under nation building, the nation building program in New South Wales, um, the state housing authority built 6,000 properties. Now, that was 2009, and the sector was very different then. We didn't have the development capacity that we have now. But of those 6,000 properties that were titled transferred to community housing providers, we delivered almost 2,000 extra properties on top of that. So what you can see delivered by community housing providers is this virtuous development cycle. It actually recreates and creates more housing by putting that through the community housing sector. Um, and we're at a very different stage now. You know, over the last 10 years, community housing providers have built 3,500 properties in New South Wales. That's more than double or triple what the State Housing Authority has delivered because of that underinvestment, that chronic underinvestment. Um, but there's no magic pudding for a sub-market subsidised housing product. And I think we've talked about <coughs> this here now. Someone has to pay a subsidy to make social housing and affordable housing be built at scale. And there's many ways you can do that. Your land contribution, or I think that the federal government's talking about a subsidy that's on top of that. And sometimes you have to layer both of those together. But there is fundamentally a gap because of the costs of development and the costs of land in, in Australia that we will need to bridge. That's why we can't even get build to rent housing at full market rent at any scale in Australia at the moment. So we really need to make sure that those levers come together and that the states and, and, and the Commonwealth are talking about that delivery and maximising the amount of housing. And finally, I'll just say, you know, community housing providers are by community for community. We know our tenants. We know our local community and our local service networks. And we can respond innovatively to the needs in our local community. And Bridge Housing is a great example of that because we 
traditionally operated in the inner city and we were one of the first community housing providers to introduce Housing First in Australia, where you take people directly from the street, put them in a home with wraparound support services. The only reason we could do that is because of those strong community networks and those partnerships with agencies on the ground. That's the only way we could do it. Um, or we have a not-for-profit real estate agency, Home Ground. And that came about because different local governments were putting requirements on developers to actually say, if you get some uplift, you need to create more affordable housing and we want a community housing provider to, to manage that. And that's where our not-for-profit real estate agency came from. So it's about responding innovatively to those local conditions. But I will say that there needs to be you know, as an old policy person, I, I do believe policy is incremental, so I'm not going to say detonate. Um, we, we actually do know the solutions. We know what the policy levers are to create more social and affordable housing. What we lack is a political will to do that at scale. And that's where we really need to be focusing our effort to say that a safe, secure home belongs to everyone. Everyone has the right to that. It's a human right. And now it's up to government to make those levers work well for their community. Well, come on, audience. <laughs> That's, yeah, that was a, that was a, a, a wonderful and inspiring um, point to end on, Rebecca. Um, John, as CEO of Shelter New South Wales, you've got a view across the whole housing system. So where do you stand on the renovate or detonate um, scale of the argument? <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. And I'd like to acknowledge the, the Gadigal people, of course, whose land in which we meet. Um, it's one of those things, the closer you move to the housing system to look at it, it's a bit like some of those inspections we've all been on as a renter or a buyer. You think <laughs> you've got this frantic five minutes to make a huge decision about your life, and you get back and you say, oh, I think we really like that property. Did it have a dining room? <laughs> I think it had a laundry. Anyway, like, like the closer you get and the longer you've got to look at our housing system, I think the more we all have to concede, it's broken. It's severely broken. And where we thought it might not have been broken, we previously thought about a few Band-Aids, a few Band-Aids keep coming to mind. And at the moment, three I hear all the time, and they are uh, tiny houses. So, great, fantastic, love the design, great nod. But if one more person comes to me and tries to convince me that by putting a pitch roof on a very small caravan, <laughs> it somehow is a solution to our housing crisis. But hats off. And I don't want to, never want to be negative. It's supplying more stock. Great idea. But they're called caravans, right? If you put wheels on them. <laughs> the other one is meanwhile use. And a great idea. But, but meanwhile, there's usually a reason why it's got a meanwhile use. So I've worked previously in aged care and other areas. There's a reason why we say that particular property, which has usually got shared block bathrooms, six people in a room, it's no longer fit for its particular purpose. So whilst it's meanwhile being redeveloped to something else, it's a, it's a Band-Aid. The one that I see all the time, and I, I think the fact that the ABS in this country has had to introduce a new category called Rent Vestas, I'm one of those, with this tiny little house we live in, Rebecca and I will share stories about once you've got that, that third little one, you know, it tips the scales in terms of where are they all going to sleep. So you go, OK, we'll rent ours out and rent somewhere else. The fact that that's a new, relatively new category means that we have to have a whole discussion, not just restricted to the obvious, you know, um, end at the continuum that's about government overt intervention or overt subsidies, but the whole system. So when I add those three things together, I think we really do need radical reform. In fact, I think this house that was once built on sandstone, the housing system in Australia, we, we, we seduced lots of people from Europe escaping political, economic, religious persecution and said, come to Australia, you will have home ownership. So to that end, as a policy, it worked, but it's now had its time. So this sandstone property that we've all looked at and metaphorically owned and thought was secure, the closer we get to it, we more realise it's it's probably not sandstone, but it's built on sand. It, it, it's crumbling. So I would say, and I think the more I think about it, the closer I get, the more examples I think, and none of them on their own probably prosecute the case, but all together, add them up, we are absolutely well overdue for radical reform. And any doubts that we've had about this was shown to us by COVID. It completely ripped up the rule book. There is no playbook for how you deal with. And, and I was absolutely delighted, once upon a time, explaining to people what affordable housing was, what's an essential worker. Great discussion today. You know what an essential worker is? Someone who can't ring up and say, I think I'll work remotely today from home. If they've got to get on their train and come and clean our aged care facilities or our supermarkets or our offices, provide care, childcare, aged care, disability care, or, and there was a brief period there where, absolutely housing, but, but a brief period there where we 
absolutely all valued, really valued, the role of that checkout operator in the supermarket because we realised these people were providing us with an essential service. So the fact that we've now having discussions about affordable housing, what's an essential worker, I think it's absolutely well overdue, well time that we radically rethink our housing system. Whatever levers were needed to achieve a certain thing have been, they're now working over time. They're working against the very thing that they tried to suggest. Just one thing to probably focus on, again, as an example. Um, there is a whole group of people, I think, we often struggle with this idea of REITs, re, re, uh, um, uh, institutional investors for renters. And I know Carrie's particularly expert on this and how it works overseas. I think almost vicariously or by default, we have a huge REIT in these countries of, uh, this country of ours now. A lot of people, if you take out a mortgage at about 30, 35 years of age, it's now a 20, it's now a 30 year mortgage typically, not 25. Good luck, good luck trying to pay down at closer to six or 7% the principal, let, or the interest rather, let alone any real principal over the 30 year life that you've got. Like that's at six or seven or eight percent. So great, it reminds me that, you know, tulip walls or pyramid selling or what other schemes that we know just don't work. The fact that somebody might work their entire life, a couple or a single, to effectively rent that property from the bank for 30 years. That is a type of institutional in, of, of renting. It's, it, it's, it's almost a myth now to say that the, the, the percentage or, or the balloon payment that you might otherwise be left with at the end of those 30 years, that somehow are going to magically, and I think you'll scratch your head and say, oh, what was that for? I, I, I'm flat out trying to secure any accommodation. So just finally, I think we, we, we not only need to radically reform, rebuild and renovate, detonate the whole thing, we've got to throw out some of the metrics which we've relied on too much, I think, to our peril. We say a third, a third, a third, a third of people rent, a third of people own outright, and a third of people have a mortgage. That is such an irrelevant figure when you cut it demographically or geographically. A third of people under the age of 25 don't rent, it's much higher than that. And people in their 70s and 80s or you know, older people, a lot bigger number of that percentage or that cohort own outright. So I think it's time to radically rethink the approach, put it to bed. It worked for a while, but it's, it's overworked if you like. Now time to go back, reform. COVID's given us the excuse and uh, some new data to go with it would be good. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, John. That was a really radical demolition of the housing system. He started with tiny homes, slaying that dragon, <laughs> and he ended up with the whole system. <coughs> Harry, <laughs> over to you. Look, you've researched innovative models of financing affordable housing internationally. And you've also started to look at housing and the wider circular economy, because that's something that we haven't touched very much on here in the discussion so far, is the environmental precarity of our existing housing stock and our, and our settlements and the looming and existing um, housing crisis. What's your advice? Thank you, Nicole. And I echo your acknowledgement of country at the beginning. Um, look. You know, there's always a token finance person on these panels. And, you know, one is always expected to bring the silver bullet and the innovation. <laughs> and look, the only innovation that we need in housing finance policy is just to stick to a policy. It, that really would be, we need to detonate the silver bullet concept. If we detonate anything, it's that idea of just a quick fix. Um, I think, you know, policy certainty, and this does have to mean bipartisan policy certainty about the importance of rental housing to our society and to our economy is what would really underpin an unleashing of a lot of uh, construction activity by the community housing sector, by the public sector. Um, you know, one thing in the studying that, you know, I and several esteemed colleagues have done um, is that looking at international precursors and what other countries do is they build a lot more rental housing than Australia does and a lot of affordable rental housing. Um, one of my thoughts, uh, you can hear my accent, you know, coming from overseas 20 years ago, is that, you know, I think that some of those other international examples, they just have fewer cultural hang-ups about home ownership, partly the structural that Ben described. But, you know, partly, um, you know, ju just something that will be difficult to detonate because it's cultural. Um, rental housing, as seen in many other jurisdictions, is infrastructure. It's linked to productivity. It's linked to mobility, to household formation. 
being able to move out and form a new household. Um, there's less stigma. So um, I think that um, you know, one thing that's important to point out is that our home ownership rate is no higher than any of these other jurisdictions, these other countries we've studied, despite that you know, cultural and structural uh, predilection. So what this myopia has resulted in is a lot less rental stability and affordability for a third of us. Um, so it's also left less room for the patient capital that, you know, the super fund investment that John, you know, uh, alluded to. Um, I've worked for years to link uh, super fund investment and affordable housing. And this is industry super funds, nonprofit super funds. And um, there is a lot of appetite, as we know from a study that we've recently done. But the key points are we need to normalize investment in affordable rental housing. So not as a, an alternate investment over in this weird bucket, not as an ESG um, you know, exception that we do this year because the trustees were talking about it in the paper. It's just got to be a standardized, normalized investment. And this actually means, I'm going beyond housing now, rethinking property in Australia, rethinking real estate investment. It's more important to emphasize stable cash flow return, perhaps, than speculative windfall. An article in the paper, and you're turfed out because someone is selling out from under you. So um, that you know, these are cultural shifts that you can't detonate quickly um, away from home ownership, at, you know, and towards rental as a dignified tenure, and away from ideas of property speculation. Um, look, the good news is that there are a lot of, there is a lot of appetite in institutional super fund investment. And the reason we talk about institutional investment is frankly, you know, the LMP's own review of NIFIC last year put the cost of providing rental housing in Australia at $290 billion. This was the Leptos review of NIFIC published less than a year ago. No government can fund that. That's why we talk about these funding partnerships with institutional investors, um, as, as opposed to retail mom and dad investors. But look, there's a lot of green shoots. We've seen recently in the, in the paper yesterday in the Financial Review, um, there are investments by Australian Retirement Trust. That's the old Q Super. There's Aware Super. There's Lighthouse Infrastructure. But these are all key worker housing. So th this is important, as John just realized, but uh, I would like to see it go into deeper affordability territory. Um, you know, that could be seen. As, there's, there's the missing middle, yes, lots to go around, lots of demand, but we could go deeper. And for that, as Rebecca said, we need subsidy. So subsidized housing needs subsidy. This is just to actually build, fund the bricks and mortar. So look, I think um, we, you know, we can't fill that subsidy just by free land. Uh, we, a lot of the leverage that the community housing sector has been able to provide off of the management transfers was thanks to an affordability subsidy program that ran the NRAS, that ran uh, from 2008 to 2014. We can't have things get canceled from change of government. So we need some funding subsidies. So funding is the bricks and mortar. Financing is just making the government able to provide that funding over time, bringing in the private sector to bridge that in the meantime. So, you know, that's really what we found. Every international exemplar has, every model has that we don't. Government funding support that's been normalized, that has bipartisan support that's been running for over a generation, set and forget. There is no silver bullet. We just need to do the hard yards and to fund this. Mm. Yeah. And you didn't even get on to the green piece, but I suspect that's Wait going to come it. up in some of our <laughs> questions, which is a cue for people to start signalling. I've got Dr Catherine Gilbert here, our extremely well qualified expert in housing and key worker housing herself, um, here to um, manage the roving mic. But I'm actually going to throw the first question to one of our online audiences, uh, uh, audience members, Dr uh, Julie Lawson, who is tuning in from Amsterdam, I believe, Julie. <laughs> Maybe just Melbourne, but um, 
she hovers between the two uh, countries. I need my glasses. I don't want to get this wrong. Um, Dr Lawson asks how broad a national housing strategy should be. Should it focus only on the vulnerable or extend to the whole housing system? She also asks, um, actually she prompts, that if it might even take a wider lens to reassess the role of Treasury, which guides fiscal policy but sees housing in very narrow yeah. terms, or the RBA, focused on monetary policy but actually impacting mm. the flow of investment, as does APRA. Now, I think I'm going to throw this one to you, Ben, um, to have a first stab at the question, and then I, I'll invite one other panellist if, if anyone else wants to have a go. Yoix, you're giving me big questions, aren't you? Mm. <laughs> um, so I, I think one of the, the main problems that we have is that uh, we talk about um, housing for very vulnerable groups versus large constituencies which are seen to be normal and that has wedged politics. So the big political problem underwhelms, that undergirds all of this I think is reinforced by having a housing policy that most people believe has nothing to do with them. That the housing system works for them and this is just for some, for some small other group of people. So I think it absolutely has to be a national strategy. Um, and I think it's also right to say that we have lots of economic levers. I mean, it is very welcome, but somewhat bizarre, that the federal government has decided that the way it can fund social housing is to borrow $10 billion, invest it in the stock market, and use the returns from a stock market to invest in social housing, which is literally the policy. Yeah. Now, that suggests that we, we've done something to finance, that means we don't think public money can do what private money can do, that we somehow think that uh, investors who invest in one property and have absolutely no financial expertise but somehow make windfall gains out of this thing can make money but the Australian Treasury would be completely incapable of doing it. <laughs> like, that's nuts. Yes, it costs money, but it's not. It's, it, it, it's an investment, right? They might spend $200 billion, but they'll own $250 billion. They're going to literally make money out of this policy. So we absolutely do need to take a wider lens. We need to see housing as investment, not as spending. And I think particularly for governments, we need to see it not just as investment in that they're going to own land that's worth a, a fortune, and they will, but they're also going to deliver a series of social outcomes that, that, that also benefit them. We're going to help our hospitals, we're going to help our schools, we're going to help our uh, income tax flows. Uh, and if you think about it like that, it is actually pretty daft that the government is seeing they're not Spending. Everyone else in Sydney is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have I got any questions in the audience? Got a question over there. We'll, we'll, we'll hover between audience and online. Yeah, thank you. Is it on? It is on. Yeah. Um, so I have... I was going to... So you answered half my question, Ben. Um, I, I am wondering what um, anyone on the panel thinks is the reason for that kind of bonkers idea that for some reason or not for profit or an individual is better positioned to invest in housing than a government that assists not for profits to access a bond aggregator and to access debt. Like, is it, what is it other than ideology that makes that the situation that we are in? Jenny, would you mind if I throw that to yeah. you? Um, I think you kind of answered it in the sense that it, I think a lot of it is ideology. I mean, just to use as an example, like on the weekend I was with John, we were at a um, site of public housing just in Glebe that's just across the way that's about to be sold off and demolished by the state government. If we go to the environmental impacts for a second, this building is completely fine, like it needs a new roof and like most places in Sydney at the moment it needs some mould free paint. Mm, sure. But apart from that, like it's pretty much fine. And the state government is going to spend $20 million demolishing this building, then privatising the public land, redeveloping it and then maybe we'll get some social housing at the end of it. When it's currently 100% publicly owned, 100% public housing. But at the same time, across the way, how much are we just... Well, actually, you know, across the way, you've got the redevelopment of the fish markets. But if you look a little bit into the skyline, you see the beautiful casino logo 
And you wonder how much of that land just got handed over to a very wealthy corporate for no apparent reason and then how much public money is now being invested into oversighting that corporation because they're engaged in organised crime as a result of their dodgy money dealings. <laughs> and, it, and weirdly, you can find the money for all those things to invest. So I think, you know, so from my point of view, I feel like it is ideological and, and it is really concerning that this so-called in New South Wales Communities Plus model, which is a model that says that all of the state government properties within housing have to be self-sustaining. Yeah. So they literally have to sell off public housing to be able to afford the maintenance backlog bill. And that is not a workable model. And what it's seeing is us lose that public housing and that public land forever. And so we are seeing a huge loss in that because of a failure to understand how the system works. And this is it. Like, it's a constant thing. Everybody in Sydney that owns a property is seeing the, the, the value of their property rise. The state government has a massive property portfolio in land and housing and somehow managed to be doing the most disastrous state <laughs> of managing their properties and maintaining but also not using that in any way to leverage and to be able to invest more in public and social housing. I, I can't see it any other way because, you know, these guys running the show right now are all bankers. They all claim to be bankers. They all claim to be good at economic management and yet they seem to be completely missing the point that is happening here. So it's hard to imagine it's not anything other than ideological. Why is that? And I think it goes back to the point that we're going to see a generational change and that third, 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 but who's the third and where they come, you know, who's actually only the problem. We're going to see a generational change because... That crisis is there, but it is growing bigger and bigger each generation. And I think that is what we are all going to have to tackle on the, on the sort of detonate level, yeah. is that it's, it's, I worry, it's going to detonate itself, you know, because actually people are at a point of crisis. It's not just vulnerable people that are at a point of the crisis. During the pandemic, we had people that had been renting property in the heart of Newtown that would consider themselves incredibly, incredibly privileged with lots of disposable income that worked in events that lost their job yep. and were ringing us going, what exactly do we do now because we can't pay our rent is what is like public housing for us. And I'm like, well, there's a 10 plus year waiting list, but it should be for you. And they are people that are like never imagined that they'd be in that crisis and they're there within a month's time. They're at that pressure point. We've got a question over here. Um, I think it was Lawrence had his hand up. Yep. But while we hand you to uh, the microphone, Lawrence, I'm just going to quickly squeeze in one more question from our online audience, which actually sort of reinforces some of the points that you've been um, saying. It's actually from Matt Keane of <laughs> DLWP New Victoria. South Wales Treasurer. <laughs> no, no, no. This Matt Keane is from... D-E-L-W-P, Victoria. The Victorians will know what that stands for. Um, but I might throw it to John. He asks whether state and federal governments should continue to focus on home ownership or instead focus on building a market rental system facilitating long-term and secure tenancies. Uh, I'm going to very quickly say yes and. It, 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 not only yes and, they should focus on both home ownership and, and there shouldn't be a class divide. There shouldn't be this thing... I'm a second-class renter, which I think Leo and others have absolutely highlighted and continue to do so. We say that um, in the New South Wales um, uh, budget that was released earlier this year, the word renter, rental, completely missing, completely missing, all focused towards home ownership initiatives. Yes. So two things. Yes, definitely state and federal should work together to do both. I'll go one step further and say the missing link here, or the missing elephant in the room here is local government. Because despite the fact that we often say in Australia, we, we all know that there's one level of government too many, we just can't decide which one it is. Um, <laughs> when all three of those line up, so when we've got... people think it's mine, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I've got a few local councillors here as well. Um, we, um, we, we know that when they three of them work together, the cumulative effect, the leverage in that can happen. So and I'm thinking very quickly about an example. Um, uh, Dr Kim Horton, who did some research for us recently, uh, so Centre for Regional Development, New South, uh, Centre for Australian Regional Development, says it's time that we had local councils who often own car parks in small country towns very quickly built one and two bedroom units because if they don't, they're not going to be able to have their essential workers. So something as simple as that, federal government putting in some money, state government allowing through its various systems, but local government, I think, is often missing in action. It's, to be honest, been a bit in hibernation. COVID has said through people moving, let's get local councils. So to answer that question, 
all three levels of government together need to do both. And welcome to our local government participants That's here right. and online. And we know that many of you have worked really tirelessly and faced other barriers as well. Um, Lawrence. I, I'm not sure which way to go because I want to ask about 15 questions. Um, so I'm going to just pick one. Um, before Nicole's mentioned sort of housing needs and I think a figure of a million plus dwellings has popped up. Um, I might have had a hand in some of that. Uh, but just to put it in perspective, that's over a sort of a 20-year period. Uh, and in Sydney, you're talking about a third to 40% of all new dwellings for 20 years would need to be in the category of social and affordable dwellings. And it's a bit similar Australia-wide, but in some places it reaches 50%, like around Parramatta and so forth. Now, that is effectively saying we don't need any more private rental housing built in Sydney for the next 20 years um, because we have enough already. What we need is these other kinds of dwellings. Um, what does that mean for the housing supply system and how we develop our cities? Great. Um, thanks, Lawrence. All right. Who wants to take that one on? And I'm looking at um, Rebecca. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought you wanted to go. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Leo, Rebecca. Leo's up. Briefly, though. Uh, I think there's two bits to that. So I actually think, and there's a bit of a chance for people in the room, I don't think Australia knows what a good rental market looks like. I don't think anyone understands the vacancy rate of the effect in Australia. I don't think anyone's done the numbers to go what would actually be equilibrium uh, in sub-markets. So, you know, we, we hear 3% and so on. I think there's a really interesting question there, though, is my feeling is, um, and some of you you know, know that New York classes anything under 5% as a housing emergency. It's the basis of their rent control system that um, anything below 5% is a housing emergency because of the impact it has on the relationships. If we were going to ensure that there was enough housing stock in the system to provide the kind of market incentives for people to act differently towards each other, that means that just in the private sector, part, we'd need to maintain something like 50 to 100,000 properties livable that someone could move into if they wanted to, but empty. And that seems extraordinarily wasteful. And I think that's the thing that comes out from, from your research and others is that not only do we kind of already have enough private rental, we already have enough buildings, kind of full stop at the moment. Obviously, we need more as population grows. But at, at the moment, we, we don't actually have too many buildings. What we have is a problem of uh, kind of the use of those buildings and uh, who's able to move into them, who's able to, to, to use them. Um, you know, even things like the affordability measures that we use tend to measure after all the poor people have been kicked out of an area and go, okay, what do we need to meet the needs of that community now that we've already moved on, <laughs> you know, the, all, the, all these people, which is really backwards if you want to make sure that people are around to make coffees and uh, clean houses and, and take care of people. So, you know, it, I think that um, what we need is to understand the current uses of the stock of the buildings um, and actually create a new sort of social contract around what that looks like. And then uh, that lets us build things like publicly funded housing, whoever's delivering it, uh, to, to meet the, the needs uh, as we go forward. And that will keep releasing the pressure. But I think that, that basically that understanding of actually how things are working now is not yet there, despite Australia's actually very strong housing academia, <laughs> you know, which is kind of surprising to me. Did you want to add anything, Rebecca? No? No. OK. <laughs> Look, I've got the... Um, I'm starting to get the wind up, um, but because... Oh, I can see a great question, but I'm sorry. I am getting a wind up. We've got one question left by a very bright member of our online audience, and I think it's a good one to end on. Um, of course, it won't end for us. We'll be taking it out there. There's lots of, um, lots of refreshments out there waiting for us. But let me put this to you, and I'm going to put it to each of you, so, you know, it's going to be like a 10-word or less kind of a situation. Um, it is a panel on Australia's future housing system. So if we imagine ourselves, all of us in this room in 50 years' time, maybe we'll have paid off our mortgage 
Absolutely <laughs> <laughs> not. But what's the one big system change that you'd like to see? And we'll start with you, Carrie. Oh, thank you, Nicole. Look, mm -hmm. I would really like to see affordable rental housing, social housing, go from a point of residualization and fatigue to a point of optimistic, and this is where I'd like to bring in circular economy thinking. We could have social housing precincts that are homes for community hubs for uh, regenerative economy. I want a future proof. Our colleagues, um, you know, people who live in these resilient communities, they already have to be very resilient, but I would love to see um, a more um, dignity and future proofing and more efficiencies for tenants yeah. um, through these incorporations, you know, specifically of um, employment opportunities, you know, like uh, Reconnect Project, look that up. Um, you know, the circular economy is just as much about employment as it is about the environment, and that is so appropriate for these very strong community housing and social housing communities. That's what I'd love to see. Thanks, Carrie. Mm -hmm. John? Uh, in 50 years' time, I'd love to see two things. One, that we have more subjective rather than objective measures, because when we talk about affordability, it's often at the expense of amenity. So we hear about low cost construction, it's creeping in. Two things, measures in 50 years time that measure someone's sense of security, not just whether they can afford it. Much harder to measure, but we're all, we're all in this group. And more than one A, it's not just affordability, it's amenity, accessibility, agency, all those A's, you can line them up. It, there's there's got to be more than just one. I think if we go too far down the path of affordability, it will be at the expense of these others. Mm. Rebecca. Uh, look, I'll piggyback off Carrie. I think that we need a, a proper funded um, social and affordable housing system that meets the needs that are in the community. That has not only the benefit of meeting uh, the needs of those immediate people, but it places less mar pro you know, pressure on the private market and it actually would create better outcomes for everybody in rental accommodation. So having a really clear strategy that says this is what we need to do, this is how many properties we need to build mm. and we're actually going to maximise that by building them through community housing providers because we want to make sure we've got as much housing and better services for people who need it in the community. Thanks, Rebecca. Leo? Poor, um no homes uh, left behind, I think. At the, at the moment, we have uh, too many people uh, just left out of the conversation, left out of the concern of uh, government, of community. Uh, we, we, we make sure that everyone is actually being taken care of in, in, in their home. So everything everyone has already said is, is the root to that. Um, and we just... we. We have homes that people can rely on, that they can afford, that they can feel safe in. Yeah. Mm. I yeah. think, Jenny. I think I would say if we were to vision ahead to 50 years that I would love to imagine a situation where the concept of like housing segregation just didn't exist. Mm. So people didn't get categorised and segregated. Oh. Where, we, where we did redevelopments of public housing and we segregate and one block is private and one block is public or we segregate people between community housing or private rental or these things. And I think the risk is the more categories we get, meanwhile use, tiny homes, mm. build to rent, build to sell. Build to sell, just by the way, is just privatisation. They just <laughs> have a new name. But I think, to me, that segregation is the biggest risk because it means that we're not recognising the humans that need a safe, secure place to live. What we're doing is thinking of like products and packages and things that we can sell and profit from. And so if we move, have moved away from that segregation, we have become more fe people focused in the kind of things we want to make sure which gives people that security and that care rather than different models of profit that people can make money from. Thanks, Jenny. And Ben? If I've got two, uh, that we spend uh, $50 billion investing in public housing, not $100 billion in tax concessions for private housing, <laughs> and uh, that no one thinks they're going to get evicted. Mm. Yeah. 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 Look, this has been such a terrific conversation and debate. At times, I don't want it to end for us in the room. It doesn't have to. 
for those of you online, there's heaps of Festival of Urbanism content that you can get into, including the Festival of Urbanism Book Club. There's lots of housing <laughs> talk on the, on the book. It's, these people are laughing. I think they know my interest. <laughs> but look, there's lots of um, there's lots of great there's lots of great stuff. But look, please join me in thanking what an absolutely phenomenal uh, panel and a great audience tonight. Thank you. Thank you.